Good evening. Welcome to Conversations About Autism. Tonight is about autism and feeding, safety, and medical considerations. We'll begin promptly at 7 p.m. Thanks for joining. Hi everyone, and welcome to Conversations About Autism. This is a new series that was started this year that includes a discussion with families, self-advocates, and content matter experts about interesting and important topics identified for and by individuals with autism and their families and communities. Our topic for tonight's conversation involves safety and medical considerations for individuals who struggle with eating and drinking. We're going to spend time today discussing how to ensure that people maintain health and wellness and how people think about risks to health with restricted eating. We'll learn from our guests' personal and professional experiences and how they individually think about safety and the impacts on health when someone has a very specific or restricted diet. I will first introduce myself and then our guests, and then we'll get started with our conversation. My name is Lauren Kipp, and I work as a speech language pathologist at Seattle Children's Hospital. One of the teams I have the privilege of supporting is the Pediatric Feeding Program, where I work alongside my team members and, of course, many amazing families to support individuals with feeding challenges. I'm really excited to introduce our guests tonight. and know that tonight's conversation will be really interesting and informative for all. I speak on behalf of Seattle Children's and the larger community and thanking our guests for sharing of themselves tonight. Because we're gonna talk about eating and food and drinking, um, um, we're, I'm gonna ask a question of our guests related to one of their favorite foods and maybe one of their least favorite foods and some reasons why. So I'll share first. Um, one of my favorite foods um, would be bagel with cream cheese. Um, I love how it tastes and I'm from the East Coast and there are bagel places everywhere there. So it makes me think of home. Um, and one of my least favorite foods um, would be sardines. My grandpa used to make myself and my sisters eat them on special holidays. And I just did never liked the taste and the, the, the smell and the texture. So they're just not my favorite. 
Um, okay, so I'd love to get to know our guests tonight and introduce them. Um, let's start with um, Dr. Marina Panopoulos. Can you please introduce yourself and share one of your favorite and one of your least favorite foods? Yes, hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Dr. Marina Panopoulos. I'm one of the gastroenterologists at Seattle Children's, and I have the privilege of being the medical director of the feeding team. Um, I would say my favorite food is cheese of any kind. I love the texture, the creaminess, the saltiness. I love cheese. Mm -hmm. And then um, probably my least favorite food, which is controversial for some people, is uh, like baked fruit pies. I don't like the slimy texture of baked fruit. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thanks for sharing, Dr. Marina. <laughs> we all have our we all have our individual preferences, and we'll respect it. <laughs> um, okay, um, our next uh, set of guests um, would be Serena, and then her mother Thaden. Please share about yourselves and um, and one of your favorite foods and least favorite foods. Well, I'm actually, and this is Thaden. <laughs> but um, favorite. Food and your least favorite. I'm gonna my first off, my favorite would have to be portobello mushroom. Would be my favorite food. And then my least favorite food would be tomatoes. Tomatoes. I okay. don't like Steven, can I ask you to if you can explain why you like portobello mushrooms? Well, I like them because they season the flavor with salt and pepper cooked into them for me. It's my favorite okay. way to eat. Okay, okay, okay. I can I can relate to that. And then can you share a little bit about um, why tomatoes are one of your least favorite foods? It's the, it's the flavor that I like about them. Just don't like tomatoes because they're flavor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thaden, for sharing. And um, Serena and Thaden, I want to let you guys know that your audio is a little bit inconsistent. So I might give you a signal and maybe with my finger and maybe that will, um, maybe that will, that will mean you can maybe turn your video off and that may improve your audio connection. <clears throat> so let's keep going. Yeah. But We've We've been kicked off twice too, so we're having some connection issues. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, apologies and thanks for your persistence. If you can keep trying to 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 join us, that's great. But if not, no no stress. So let's just continue with our conversation, and then um, we'll see we'll see if it improves as we get going. Um, and I would really like to kind of pose one of our first questions to you, Faden. Um, um, if you could kind of share for yourself, um, what have what have doctors or medical profession professionals in your journey, in your experiences, um, done that's helped you understand um, your issues with feeding and your risks with eating? Um, well, they do actually. There's a lot of things that they help with like they they explain why I need the medicines and how they work. Thank you, Thaden. I can't really think of anything. I I think let's try you guys. Let's try to maybe turn your, your video off for a second. Thaden, your your um the, what the information you're sharing is so important and the audio is just a little bit inconsistent. Oh, I wonder if they're gone now. I don't see them. Is that um, better? Oh, Thaden and Serena, can, can are you, you still present? Me? Yes. 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 We're yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. We can't see you. I thought maybe a box would stay, but okay, good. You're still with us. Okay. So Thaden, yes. I, um, I want to repeat what I think you shared with us to make sure that we heard your message correctly. So, um, Thaden, I think you shared that 
some doctors and medical professionals in your journey so far have um, helped you understand why you need to take certain medications. Did I hear you correctly, Faden? Was that correct? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Okay. That's great. Serena, do you have anything else to add as Thaden's mother around what, what has been helpful from all the, the medical assessment um, that Thaden has experienced over time? Um, we, we've worked very closely with dietitians. Um, we've gone through your feeding therapy program, which has been the biggest help, honestly. Um, but having them explain that, you know, certain foods cause constipation or cause the pain or, you know, might not be good if she's having a flare up with her Crohn's or, or something like that. And, um, and then her latest diagnosis of EOE, um, that's a new struggle she's dealing with, with they've had to explain, okay, well, you have to do elimination diets and try different foods. We have to figure out what's causing your EOE. And so uh, she understands, she understands that um, she has to try removing foods from her diet to figure out what's causing this problem for her health. And so by explaining that to her, she knows that she needs to do it. So she's more willing um, with with the explanation because it's it's hard for anyone to do that, let alone a child, you know, to to have to cut things that they love out of their diet. Yes. So that's yeah. I'd love to I'd love to um, revisit some of those those concepts that you just kind of expressed in those those um, hills you both have had to climb together related to her restricted diet. But first, Dr. Panopoulos, could you help us all understand what Serena means by EOE? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So EOE stands for eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, and so it's a very long term, but we can kind of break it down. So esophagitis, right, is just inflammation of your esophagus. And then eosinophilic esophagitis relates to allergy cells in the esophagus causing inflammation. Um, and the reason that uh, Thaden and Serena were talking about certain foods um, causing issues is that what happens is food proteins that touch the esophagus literally cause inflammation. And so the treatment, one of the treatment uh, methods is to eliminate certain foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that really dovetails nicely with, you know, when I kind of approach um, families and patients looking at feeding issues, whether I'm working in GI or whether I'm working with the autism center, I really think about is, is this just a food aversion and you don't like it? Or is there some underlying medical issue going on that's really preventing you from being able to eat certain types of food? I mean, EOE is a great example. Um, so I've identified a lot of kids and through the program that have come through that we end up diagnosing with EOE or celiac disease um, who can't tolerate wheat um, and even inflammatory bowel disease um, like Thaden and Serena were talking about. And Thaden, I'm wondering um, if this, if these, these diagnosis, I heard your mother mention Crohn's and EOE for you. Um, if these, these medical conditions, you've always known you have them, or if when, at, when you were younger, um, what eating and drinking was like, if it was easy at first, or if you needed some help when you were younger. Um, I, I don't really know because that was quite a long time ago, so I don't really remember. That's fair, that's fair. I wonder if, if, if Serena, if, if you as, as Thaden's mom, could you speak to kind of the beginning of, of Thaden's journey with eating and some of the challenges and, and um, along the way, what you guys learned together? Absolutely. Um, Thaden always had food aversions and food avoidance. Um, even as a very young toddler, uh, we, we worked closely with our WIC nurses um, because I was very concerned at a very young age. And that was before we got the autism diagnosis and the feeding disorder diagnosis. Um, and I would very often be told, oh, well, if you just take away 
the other options, then yeah. eventually she'll eat it. Just, just give her this food, you know, and eventually when she gets hungry enough, she'll eat it. Um, and that did not work for Thaden. Thaden would literally starve herself. And, you know, that, that was not an option. We did not know about the Crohn's early on. When Thaden was about four, we got a diagnosis of ulcerative proctitis. And that was very different um, because that was the only part of her intestine that was affected at the time. It has since spread. Um, but her eating, she was always kind of a picky eater. And then um, EOE is very recent as of just a few months ago. So that's a very new thing that she's having to deal with um, that just has happened. And her Crohn's uh, was just diagnosed this last year. So as we've gone through the years, her eating and her diet has changed. I personally have celiac, so she was on a gluten-free diet because we didn't know, okay, is this is this a, a gluten um, intolerance, like what I deal with, or is this, you know, something else? And so um, we had to slowly add things to her diet and then see how it went. And... Um, She's always been very selective about her food choices, even when she was a very, very young toddler. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, that that small kind of example of your, of your guys' journey um, to kind of discover what all is happening internally for Thaden as it relates to, to food and eating. Um, I'm wondering, Thaden, um, what it's been like for you as you've learned new things that you need to avoid, um, how you've learned to cope. Um, can you share your, your thoughts about that as you've learned about how, what, what certain foods might do, do to your body? Well, first of all, cheese is very constipating. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. That's okay. Take your time. think I'm ever gonna remember what I'm about to say I was about to say that's okay. You're <laughs> that's okay that I so appreciate that that insight into what what that particular food does for your body um I I'd love to invite Dr. Panopoulos to talk about how how you how you think um about different assessments and what assessments you you recommend for kids who you meet who have differences in how they eat and how you might feel um, there might be risks to their health. And, and Thaden mentioned constipation as something that she experiences. So could you speak to how you yeah. design assessment so that you understand if, if a person's experiencing something like constipation, it may be related to their, their eating or what they're putting in their body? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, overall health can impact eating and feeding and then feeding and eating can impact your overall health. So it's kind of a cyclical um, thing that's happening there. Um, I think, you know, like I said before, you can have underlying medical issues that are impacting your ability to eat. But when I'm assessing patients and uh, families and children, like kind of looking at the whole picture, um, I really do want to get a full medical history and like understand, you know, medications and previous uh, hospitalizations and surgeries, regardless if they relate to like the GI system or not. Um, and then looking at overall growth too, like weight, length, like, uh, how, you know, how are kids growing overall? And then looking really with the help of our dietitians, like caloric intake versus um, food variety, like are we having a uh, good representation of all the different types of food groups? Um, so looking looking kind of overall at all of those things. I mean, I think Serena, you said something really nice, which was like I was alerted from very early on that I was worried about Thaden and eating. And um, it's really helpful as a medical provider to have partnership with parents who come and are interested in um, like kind of going down, not only for workup in terms of what could be causing feeding issues, but then also like, how can we help um, from the medical perspective? And so that often we'll see constipation. So if patients aren't um, drinking enough 
Um, that can be one form of restriction. So we'll see constipation or like very specific food choices that uh, support constipation. So some people have that with cheese. Some people have that with a, like a lot of carbohydrate intake and not enough fiber intake with fruits and veggies. Um, so, and then, you know, from a GI perspective, we'll also see kids who have reflux. Um, so if there's a greater preference for fatty foods, spicy foods, like, you know, then we could see maybe more along the reflux side of things. So, like I said, it's like our eating impacts our bodies and our bodies impact our eating. So it's kind of looking at the continuum. Yeah, that's helpful to hear that um, you're thinking around a comprehensive medical assessment and look really to understand what could be underneath the, the feeding challenges. Um, and also not only the feeding challenges, but also what's happening with that person's body and could yeah. it be related to the specific foods. Yeah. Yeah. Dayton, I'm wondering, are there any other foods you, you know, um, uh, don't agree with or upset your body and, and, and could you explain those to us or describe them for us? Well, there's a couple, which are those two things are greasy food. Bananas. Bananas, okay. And and how does it feel to have to avoid those foods um, for you? Well, for me, it's actually kind of frustrating because those are two things that I really like. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I could understand that feeling then related to it. Um, what helps you with your frustration when you can't eat those foods or you know you shouldn't? What helps you with your frustration? Well, um, there's not really anything that helps me with my frustration. The frustration is just kind of there that I can't eat those foods very often. Yeah. But I do get to eat them sometimes. Okay. Okay. So, so being able to still enjoy them sometimes, um, mm -hmm. would you, would you say that that's, that's helpful, that that helps you kind of cope with the fact you can't have them all the time? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious, Thayden, if you remember anything about feeding therapy and, and what was helpful, can you, can you recall what feeding therapy was like for you? Um, I don't remember anything about feeding therapy. I don't remember. Yeah, that's fair. That sounds like it was a while ago for you. Um, do, Thayden, can I ask your mother to remember? Can she ask me? Uh-huh. Okay. So, um, one of the things that I remember that really helped the most is therapist rushed right into, okay, well, you need to try to taste this. It was, it was done in steps, you know, so it was touch and then, you know, put it to your lips and then maybe put it to your tongue. And then, you know, maybe can you, do you think you could take a bite? And we worked up to it and it was a lot of, you know, getting comfortable with the food first before, you know, being willing to put it in your mouth and actually try to taste it. <laughs> And I think that is what helps Thayden the most. Sometimes it took her longer with touching um, before she was willing to move to the next step. And that was okay. And just being able to be flexible. And I think also it helped by taking her to the store with me. Okay, what foods do you want to try this week in therapy? You pick out the vegetables or you pick out the fruits that you want to try. And she picked out portobello mushrooms. And now it's one of her favorite foods. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad I tried it. <laughs> as as a person who who um, it helps people in in the context of feeding therapy, it's exciting for me to hear you say, "I'm glad I tried it, Thayden." Um, I think that speaks to everything you've learned about how to to think and help yourself with food. So um, that's exciting to hear. Um, um, I was wondering, Thayden, too, it sounds like you, early on in feeding therapy, you learned uh, how to be flexible and how to how to have food experiences, right? Um, it sounds like from what your mom was describing. So I'm wondering, um, as you've learned about, you know, your body and your, your EOE, um, 
and you've had to, I'm sure, eliminate certain foods and potentially try new foods. Can you think of a new food you had to try recently that was hard at first? Um, I, I can't really think of anything. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I can't really think of anything. Oh, almond milk. Oh, right. Almond oh. milk. Almond milk. Okay. I, that, I wasn't really a huge fan of it. And is that still true? Or have you have you learned to think about it differently as you've tried it? Well, um, I tried I tried it and I was like, yeah, I don't like it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, that makes me think, Dr. Marina, around, you know, when you have to um, maybe discuss risks with parents and, and children around what certain foods really aren't, aren't the best for their bodies and then mm -hmm. how to help them through finding alternatives. Can you kind of speak to your experience with helping families understand risk and understand how to, to seek alternatives and cope with? Yeah. Yeah. Food, yeah. I mean, I think um, Serena and Thaden actually did a really nice job earlier talking about this. It's really like creating a partnership, I think, with families and uh, kids. And when you understand what these things are sort of doing, like, so if you have like celiac or EOE or certain patients with Crohn's have certain um, foods that they avoid, when you understand how those foods are making you feel and how they're affecting your body better, then you certainly are buying in more readily to eliminate them. Um, for the alternatives, I rely heavily on my nutrition colleagues because they can present um, multiple options because the truth is like, if you're used to drinking cow's milk, there's not another alternative that tastes just like cow's milk. So we have to like kind of try as many as we can to see what appeals to each person. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that makes sense. And I wonder about Serena, when, you, when you're listening to that, what it was like for you helping fade in with all of these changes to what is safe, what is considered safe. Our topic for tonight is safety and medical consideration. So can you speak to your experience as Thaden's mother helping her go through these food eliminations? Oh, yeah, sure. It's, um, you have to think outside the box and be really creative. And um, in my family, my husband also can't have dairy. I, like I said, cannot have wheat. So we are used to accommodating special diets. Um, so when Aiden first was diagnosed with the EOE, we had to cut out wheat and dairy. And I said, oh, well, that's simple. I can do that. I'm used to this. <laughs> and so it, it was hard for Thaden, though. Even though it's easy for me, I'm not the one who has to change my diet completely and eat something new. So Thaden had a hard time, and there was a lot of tears, um, because she had to give up chocolate. And she is a chocoholic. So uh, there are alternatives had to do and you know changing her bread to a gluten-free dairy-free bread and like I explained to Thayden you know okay you might not like this one but there's so many brands so many different flavors let's find one that you like and I went out and bought several until we found the one that she that she preferred and we found a gluten-free white bread that she liked better than the multi-grain um you know there was different milks we tried probably goodness, six different types of dairy-free milk alternatives. Um, and she didn't really care for any of them. She wanted chocolate milk. And we found a uh, chocolate almond milk. And she said, well, it's okay. But she didn't really like it. You know, but but she understood. And it was extremely hard. And now she can have back her wheat and dairy. And she's cutting out soy. Well, we're finding that soy is in everything. So it's trying to find the alternatives that, you know, maybe you might not like this brand, but there's other brands out there. Let's find the one that you do like. And maybe I might have to make some stuff homemade because you can't find it in the grocery store. And just being able to be flexible and, and you know, trying to be positive about it with her because it, it's really hard on me too. 
I think way harder than it is on me. Thank you so much for speaking to all of that. I, I'm humbled by the, your guys' um, partnership and how you team together around, you know, food and eating and um, what's hard, but also what's possible. I just hear a lot of um, positivity and teamwork and support. Um, so, so appreciate you sharing that part of your guys' relationship and your journey um, together um, with yeah. food. Um Thaden, Thaden, can you share how how it makes you feel when you get to try a new food lately? Can you think of a new food that you tried recently? Um, let's start there. Yeah. Can you think of a new food you tried recently? Yeah, there's one that's banana. It's, it's homemade banana bread. That makes me excited because I think I recall bananas are are is a food that you that you enjoy. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And so, what was it like when you tried this new banana bread? How did you feel? I was like, oh my god, this is so good! <laughs> <laughs> it's like I just wanted to eat the the whole two loaves of it. <laughs> Oh, like that makes me happy to hear. I'm so glad you were able to have that food experience because one, in addition to like nutrition, right? And uh, food is food is meant to be something we enjoy, right? So um, that's exciting to hear that you enjoyed that banana bread so much. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, people, we, I want to invite everybody who's watching to ask us questions um, in the chat. Um, we have we have space and time built into our conversation to invite you to ask some questions. So uh, please do when we have some other people helping us monitor the chat and kind of warning us and letting us know if there's a question. And so I see that there has been one. Um, and um, yes, so I see a question from Tom. Um, I think Dr. Marina, this, this may be a good one for you to field. What types of tests are needed for food intolerance? That's such a good question. Um, well, uh, there's a couple of different tests that we can use for a couple of targeted sort of food intolerances, but I would say on the whole, we don't have a lot of evidence-based testing for food intolerances. Um, so when we're talking about something like um, celiac disease, for example, which is like more like an autoimmune or an allergy, we have like an, a blood test we could do and do some screening, but food intolerances wouldn't show up on a blood test. So the, the testing that we can do is for lactose um, and for fructose. Um, so two different sugars and they're breath tests that we perform really the tests are a little bit uh, labor intensive for people to go through. Um, you have to drink a large load of lactose or uh, a fructose containing substance and then do breath tests for a long period of time that same day. Um, and you have to restrict your diet before those tests. So often what I recommend is kind of doing an elimination of one and see if you're thinking if you've noticed a pattern in yourself, like, boy, when I eat foods with high lactose in them, I'm having a lot of symptoms, trying to restrict that for like a week at least or two and seeing if you see a difference is really actually the greatest test of a food intolerance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of just, you know, unfortunately, item, more itemized restrictions. Yeah. Interesting. That's really interesting. Um, I appreciate your um, explanation of some of these tests being quite effortful. Um, and it makes me think of, of who they would be really indicated for based on what it's asking the person to do. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other tests that would be good to kind of bring up in our conversation tonight that um, assess for, <clears throat> you know, specific medical conditions related to, you know, your, yeah. your, your GI system and, and restrictive eating? 
Yeah, I mean, we have, um, because I'm involved with the program, and even when I see children with feeding issues outside of the program, I like to do nutritional screening tests. So looking to see if, if you're restricted in your diet, are you maybe not getting enough um, vitamin C, folate, B12, those kinds of things. But then also looking for underlying conditions like celiac, thyroid disease, um, conditions like that, that may be impacting your ability to eat. So those are tests I do. We don't routinely do food allergy testing. There's issues um, with like false positive results with those. So I wouldn't want to restrict anybody unnecessarily from being able to eat certain foods. So that's not a, a part of my panel that I regularly do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I see another question um, around how, how you would navigate this process or this assessment journey with an individual, with a person who is nonverbal. Um, um, and I, I would love to weigh in too um, with the work that we do together on the team, but Dr. Marina, could you kind of speak to that right now? Well, first? yeah. I mean, I think, you know, objective parameters in terms of like weight and length and growth and labs are always helpful to me, but they become more critical if I, um, I'm, I'm not able to ask a child directly like how they're feeling when they're eating. Um, and then I rely a great deal on the family. So even though a child may be nonverbal, they have many ways of being able to communicate. Um, and families obviously know their children best better than anybody else. So they can kind of help me navigate, like uh, we're seeing like when my child's eating this specific food that we're having a problem or this texture or that kind of thing. So I do rely heavily on families. And um, with nonverbal children, I would say that I'm probably fast uh, moving forward to more workup with imaging or procedures if I'm concerned about poor growth um, because I'm just not able to get information in a different way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, that resonates with um, how I think often when I'm on an evaluation team with an individual who's not able to tell me themselves what's happening um, with if they eat something and something happens they don't like, or also if they're they're not eating it and we don't know why and we are trying to evaluate why won't won't they eat this or experience this or um, and so um, from my perspective as a speech pathologist, if I can weigh in on that question, um, when I'm meeting a, a individual, um, I think about whether or not the skill required to eat a certain food is, is, is one of the reasons why they will or will not eat it. Um, I also think about the, the um, sensory components of the food is, is that, could that be a reason why or why, why not they, they will or um, will not eat it? Um, and then I'm listening for symptoms related to it, it, if they ate a food and then something happened, right? And so Dr. Marina, I know you and I partner a lot around that, right? If the child's having certain symptoms um, that might tell us their body that that food is not agreeing with them. Um, and then there's that assessment pathway. Um, and so I think um, having the ability to have an individual have a really comprehensive evaluation from lots of different perspectives, right? Um, to dig into the potential contributors for the feeding challenge. Um, and we know, you know, um, the population we're really speaking about and to this evening is individuals with autism and individuals with autism often um, is a high percentage of having very restricted particular diets or food preferences, right? Um, and so um, there can be many reasons why an individual with autism may or may not have a specific feeding challenge. And so the, it, it's definitely important to have that comprehensive assessment and not just assume it has, it has only to do with the food texture, mm -hmm. um, food flavor. Um, um, and I think Thaden, part of what we've learned from your story tonight is your journey over time, understanding your body. Um, um, and what is happening for you um, with food, right? Um, um, so, so yeah, I, I hope that helped answer the question, the person who asked. Um, 
Um, I think I'd like to, I see that there's another um, comment that popped up, but I want to pause just for a second and kind of return um, and talk more with Thaden. Um, um, Thaden, I'm, I'm reflecting on everything we're learning about you and your journey with eating and just recognizing that um, you may have a very different feeling when you come to the, to the table for a meal. Um, I'm wondering what makes you feel comfortable um, to eat at the table. Can you think of things that help you feel comfortable eating? Yeah, well, what makes me comfortable at the table while I'm eating? One thing, the uh, only, well, the only thing is that um, I know that the food is going to constipate me. Mm. Thank you for sharing. That's really in interesting to think about. So it sounds like you'll feel most comfortable if you know that food will not do that to your body. Am I hearing that right, Baden? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I really appreciate you being um, so, um, so honest about that for you and what and how much that really impacts you and your awareness of, of that condition and how food can do that to you. Um, before I ask Dr. Panopoulos a related question, Serena, can you speak mm -hmm. to what, what that's like? Um, I'm, I'm a mother myself and I know my, my children eat with lots of people and there's lots of times I have to educate community about my child. Can you speak to what that's like to, to help be an advocate for Thedon, um when she's not just eating with you? Yeah, it's actually really stressful. I have to worry constantly, you know, is somebody going to give her a banana? You know, what are they feeding her if she's not here with me? You know, is it going to be coated in cheese or, and now Faden's getting a little older, she can recognize herself, you know, oh, I shouldn't eat too much of this. And she'll actually say no to some foods sometimes, which is amazing. That's, that's a huge development and huge props to her for recognizing that but when she was younger she wasn't able to do that and it was really hard to you know send her off to public school and the lunch menu consistently every day of the week would have cheese in the food and she could not personally eat that so I would have to provide but even now at meal times it is to try okay well what are what can we make for dinner or for lunch or what kids are going to eat because both my children are actually autistic and they're both on the spectrum. So, but it, it is a challenge. Okay. Well, we know that, you know, too much of this food constipating and that will affect her Crohn's inflammation and mm -hmm. pain, or if it's too greasy, it, it causes pain in her stomach. And, you know, it's a balancing act, mm -hmm. but also finding that she's willing, that she wants to eat, that she's willing to eat. And, and she, like I said, also struggles with uh, self-restriction and things that she doesn't want. And so it, it can be a little bit like walking a tightrope. Yeah. It's so important to have a platform for you to share that, um, in my humble opinion, right? We all can sit in, uh, in our offices and our medical clinics and um and get very narrowly focused. And it's so important that your voice, both of your voices be be elevated, right, around the impacts of um, of these conditions and what could happen if. And so I so appreciate your honesty um, tonight about that and how much of an impact, you know, constipation can have and just your concerns around um, helping her advocate for herself um, mm -hmm. with food. Dr. Panavos, can you speak to constipation and how you think about constipation? And I know I know we talk I think about it a lot, Lauren. I think about it a lot. <laughs> um, what What do you want it? I mean, I think it's amazing. So I think it's always amazing when like, you know, Thaden, like you're growing up, you're identifying what works for you and what doesn't work for you. That's always really exciting for me as a doctor. I I really enjoy interacting with parents, but I really enjoy interacting with kids. So that's always very fun for me. And it's, I recognize just based on what you were saying, like what a huge responsibility that is for you to take on. And it's like a little bit of a burden. It's tough work. It's not easy. Um, 
But then if you're able to identify those foods and you can keep up with fluid needs, um, there may be a little less need to take medications, but also medications can be a great help to people when they're struggling with uh, food choices. Because if you really only like a lot of foods that are constipating, it's going to take quite a while to try to diversify your diet. So that's kind of how we help in the interim is helping you with medications to keep poop moving. So we're not having belly pain and other issues related to constipation. Mm -hmm. I, I loved um, how you um, just explained that responsibility that the Eden is taking on yeah. for herself and her body and how impressive and how um, really applaud you for that the Eden as you're as you're growing and you're you're understanding yourself and what you need right to be to be as well as possible um yeah I um I liked that way of framing it right taking responsibility um yeah um I I'm curious um um Serena, we're talking tonight about safety, right? Um, and really what that what that means in the in the context of eating, right? And it, it as it relates to risk, right? Um, and I'm wondering yeah. if you could kind of speak to um, right now in your family, right? And for Thaden, um, if meal times and eating feels like a risky risky uh, business for you guys, yeah. or if you're feeling like no, we we got it. We we know we know this. We know this. We're avoiding this. Um, when you think about preparing a meal, how do you feel um, right now as as a mother? Um, honestly, I feel really comfortable preparing her food. Um, I worked as a nursing assistant for 15 years at a hospital, so I'm used to monitoring intakes and outputs and all of that. Uh, but it, like I said, we have our excuse me, our own special that we're familiar with. But it's also risky in a in a sense because the EOE is new. And so every eight weeks, you know, like I said, we tried the wheat, we tried the dairy, that came back negative. Now we're on I'm having to read every single label. Foods that we normally would eat and ha and we knew were no issue, you would not believe they put soy in everything. Mm -hmm. Um they homemade banana bread. Well that's because you go to the store and almost every baked item that you can mm -hmm. find at the store, they put soy or soy lecithin or some type of soy product in it. So um, even my even my oil, uh, you know, canola or olive oil cooking spray had, had soy in it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of risky because I have to try to remember, okay, did I, did I check the label on this or did I check the label on that? And I, she's uh, in the middle of that elimination right now for an upcoming procedure so they can biopsy and see, okay, is it soy? Well, you know, if, if she has any soy in her diet, then that kind of messes that up. So that's the risk. I feel comfortable in the fact that I know how to prepare food for her and, you know, and I know what she's willing to eat. I feel like we've got a pretty good handle on that, that aspect of it. Um, I've heard several times the mention of, you know, drinking enough liquids. And that is also something Thayden has struggled with ever since she was very young. And she's actually gotten much better, much better thinking about that too. And knowing, okay, well, I have to drink, you know, this much water a day and then take my medicine. Um, otherwise, I'm going to be having tummy pain tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I feel like we got to handle that part of it. But with the new diet changes, I, I feel a huge amount of stress around that. And also explaining to Satan too that okay well if this comes back pot you know that hey this is what it is then that means it's a permanent elimination and there's that brings a ton of stress so she's struggling with accepting that as well yeah I can imagine I can imagine um well I'm curious what what medical partners you feel like you have on your team Serena and Thaden helping you with all of this and um is there, are there any providers in particular that have been um, um, really, really valuable um, um, team members for you guys right now as, as you guys go through all of the different components of assessment over and over again? Who stands out as, as, as an important team member for you guys? I would have to say Dr. Sam. 
she is a pretty good GI dog. And I would re recommend her to anybody. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if we caught the, the name. I, I think, did you name a, a particular person, Thaden? I heard doctor and then I didn't hear the person's name. Can you repeat it? Dr. Sanford. Okay, okay. Well, you just got a shout out. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great to um, that you feel so supported by that provider. Um, any Serena, any any particular either discipline or doesn't have to be a, an individual, but anybody else come to mind that's been a really important partner for you. Um, you know, honestly, the whole team, everybody that we've worked with, has been so incredibly helpful. Um, you know, going through your guys' feeding clinic, the things that things has had to do now, she would not have been able to do before if she hadn't gone through your therapy. Trying all these different breads, trying all this different dairy options, you know, different food options, that would have never flown a couple years ago. And now she just does it like it's, you know, okay, well, I understand I have to do this. Let's do it, you know, and, and I'm so proud of her for that. Also working with the different dietitians that we've worked with because she is self-restrictive. She has all these meds that she's on and I'm concerned, okay, she's getting what her body needs. And so am I giving, do I need to give her a good multivitamin? What kind of supplement can I give her that she might be lacking? And they have worked so um, closely with us with that. And for a while, she was on a, like an Ensure milkshake, milkshake type of Supplement, um, to help with her Crohn's because it was pretty out of control when we first got the diagnosis. And we worked very closely with them for that. And now she's off of it. So it's, it's just the whole experience. I feel like we've had really wonderful um, doctors, dietitians, the nurses, everybody's been very helpful. Yeah. And listening to you, I, it's just, it's, um, it, I'm reflecting on the, the journey over time and all the discovery you've had to do over time with the number of people that's been on your team to help you and Faden um, along the way, get to where you're at now, make all the progress that you've made and understanding what, what works and what doesn't work. Um, yeah. It's, 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 it's impactful. It's powerful. It's really profound. It speaks to your guys's dedication, right. And persistence to, to, um, help they didn't feel feel well right in her body and and, and be able to eat um without negative consequence um or with less risk um yeah um dr marina can you speak to who you partner with as a as a gastroenterologist um on a medical team um to kind of over time help help a, a, a person like they and serena Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I echo definitely the dietitians are like such an asset and I work really closely with them. And then like people like you, Lauren, like speech therapists, <laughs> like occupational therapists, depending on if patients have like oral motor skill needs. Um, and then uniquely through the autism center, like psychology has, is so important. I mean, I think, you know, there's good medical literature now that looks at everything, you know, and looks at the evaluation and treatment and really values a multidisciplinary approach for that to be successful. So I think you have to have all these different people, uh, at, you know, as part of the team to really have kids being successful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm thinking too, just about how, um, how important it is to think about um, in your mental health, right? And how you're coping with all of this over time and how um, a, a, a mental health provider or a therapist that's helping you continue with your flexibility and your bravery as you continue to learn about your body. Um, I'm wondering about that service. Serena, you were mentioning about um, Thaden having to try new breads and new foods. And um, if if you both could speak to that, the therapy that Thaden's had most recently around exposure and experiencing new. Were you me? I think it was a long-winded question, but um, Thaden, I'm curious, do you, um, I think I asked you earlier about the therapy that you maybe had recently 
to help you with eating and, and what you remember from that therapy recently. Do you recall anything now? No. I don't. And that's, and that's totally okay. It's totally okay. Um, Serena, am I correct in understanding Thedens had therapy relatively recently to help um, with some feeding difficulties? Yes. Yeah. She, mm, short memory issues. So she has a hard time sometimes remembering stuff. But yeah, it was, oh gosh, I want to say within the last couple of years, <laughs> um, we went through the Autism Center's feeding therapy program. And it was, I believe it was during COVID. So we did it all through, it was all virtual. And um, it, was, it was hard for everyone, but it was so worth it. It was, uh, and you've done so many different therapies over her lifetime. Since she was four years old, she got into occupational therapy. She's done ABA therapy and four years of, of occupational therapy, speech therapy, a lot. But with the feeding program, they really focus on um, helping her with the exposure and the willingness and the, and giving her options and giving her some of that self-control too over her choices and, and helped her um, to be more comfortable with her foods too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we had not done that. I really don't think that we would have been as successful as we have been with this food elimination that we're having to do now. Yeah. I can under, yeah, I can, I can imagine too. And, um, just fade in, you know, everything you've learned about yourself and your, how you've, I, Dr. Marina brought the, use the term, how responsible you are, all the responsibility you're taking on, you know, for yourself and your, um, your well being. And so it's reassuring to hear that you've had some therapy that's, that's continued to help you on your journey to coping with these conditions that you have, um, so that eating can still be enjoyable. Um, Yes. Um, I'm going to quickly just look at, like, move my eyes to the to the chat to see if there's any other questions from the community and the, the, the people watching us. I see our time is wrapping up. Um, uh, I, I, it was requested that I mentioned we we did have another um, a group who was who was who was planning on joining us tonight, parents um, of a child. They were going to speak to their journey. Um, but unfortunately, they at the last minute they were unable to join us tonight. Sadly, so um, we're so we're so thankful that Serena and Thaden were able to still be here with us to have this conversation. Um, um, yeah, but um, we we're sad. We're sad, and we're missing the other the other guests that were supposed to join us tonight. So um, that's good to kind of bring up. Um, and then I also see kind of a question and a comment. Um, I think there's people watching tonight. Um, that are waiting for therapy or wondering about um, resources um, for feeding therapy and um, asking, you know, tips for what people can do while they're waiting for therapy, I think is the question. Um, um, and I would, based on, you know, the topic that we're grounding ourselves in tonight, this, this, um, this thought around medical assessment, right? Um, and see, you know, I think what I might say in response to that is if you're waiting for therapy and when, when I say therapy, I think of it as, you know, um, therapy, behavioral therapy to help a child be motivated to eat or to gain skill or to learn how to participate. Right. Um, I would also think about other reasons why they may be behaving or not behaving the way we're hoping at the table and to really dig in with your primary care provider or your medical team to see if there could be something else contributing to, to the picture, right? Something else that that is part of the picture that could maybe be setting the occasion for them not to want to, right, in their body. And I know Dr. Marina spoke to some of the ways that she thinks about assessment some of the um, symptoms she listens for in her assessment that might trigger her thinking that there could be something else going on that warrants medical intervention and not necessarily behavioral or occupational or speech and language intervention. Um, constipation was something that was discussed today as a pretty big um, consequence of certain eating, but also um, contributor for um, some feeding difficulties in kids. I know there's a lot of children I've known and individuals over the years that experience constipation and it really impacts their 
their hunger and their motivation and their their um, sensation inside their body and their willingness to eat. So I think I'd encourage people to partner with their medical team to um, comprehensively think about all the contributors to feeding difficulties um, outside of just um, skill and the sensory components and uh, the behavioral components of the feeding challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything to add around that? No, that was fantastic. Yeah, exactly. It's really hard to wait. Um, and I wish these services were more available. And I think during COVID, things became less and less available um, to people. So I'm hopeful that that will improve in the coming years. Same, same. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful to partner with incredible families and individuals like Baden and Serena. This really is a privilege to be able to come alongside you and be, be a support. Um, we're so grateful that you um, came tonight and shared of yourselves. Um, I know there's been a lot of people in the community here watching and listening that have um, have had a lot to learn and to take away from your, your story. So Baden, thank you so much. And Serena, thank you so much. Dr. Panopoulos, Thanks. thank you so much. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, before we close, Thayden, is there anything else you would like to share with myself or Dr. Marina or the community? Anything else you'd like to say tonight? Um, well, there is one thing, Lego build that I want <laughs> to show you. Oh, please try. Please turn your video on and try. I'd love to, we'd love to see it if we could. Oh yeah. Nice. An Imperial shuttle that I built. That's good. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Thayden. Thank you, Thayden. Really impressive. And it's pretty much done. <laughs> it looks even, really good. I even have the thrusters on it. Nice work. Look at that detail. And and I just use like just these little pieces here mm. for the back of this. Love it. Very, Very nice. Thank you, Thayden. Serena, thank you so much um, as well for sharing so much of yourself as, as a mother and um, a partner with Thayden. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us in the community tonight before we end? Well, I just, I do want to add that I know it's hard to wait for, for therapy, but it's so worth it. And I mean, really all the therapy that helped Thayden, the occupational therapy, the ABA therapy was amazing. And the feeding therapy, I mean, without it, we wouldn't be where we are. So I just would encourage other families to just wait it out and do their best. And it'll really make a difference. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Serena. Thank you so much. We're so, we're so grateful for, to both of you. And yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, well, I think that this will conclude our conversation tonight. Thank you to everyone who attended and participated. Um, we're so excited to be offering these, these conversations. Um, um, so thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>